Luke uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 38 uh, through 42. So if you would, uh, would you stand with me uh, for the reading of God's word? And as you stand, can we do this? Can we welcome everyone who's going to be joining us throughout the week uh, online? We have people from all across uh, the nation that's watching. And any, In fact, uh, just recently, someone sent an email to the church like, hey, been watching you guys for a while now, did not realize you're only an hour away, so we are coming down to visit. So we just want to uh, welcome all of you who watched throughout uh, the week. But here we are, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're grateful and we're thankful for this moment. God, thank you for this time and space that we get to share together. And Lord, we just pray over these next few moments, God, that you will open up our eyes. Allow us to see what it is that you're showing us. Lord, open up our ears. Allow us to hear what it is that you're speaking to us. Lord, we need you. We want to hear from you. And as your servants in the room, we say this, speak, Lord, because we're listening. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said, come on, come on. Everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Family, when you have kids, there are a number of things that you will learn and realize. One of those things is that you're going to have to repeat yourself. Can I get a witness in the room? Like, you're going to have to say it again. Now, you can take the stance, or you may have the stance, I'm not going to repeat myself. Some of you may have said it. Or maybe if you're not a parent, you're like, I will not repeat myself when I become a parent. Well, I got a question. For those of you who have said it, how is that working out for you? And then for those of you, when you become a parent, holler back at me in a little bit because I want to see how that goes for you. Because I know for me and my house, for Katie and I, we have to repeat ourselves. Like we could give any one of our kids an instruction, a direction. And you know what they do It's they just stare. They just look, and I'm like, what you looking at? Did you hear the instruction? Sometimes it's not even a stare. They just keep doing what they're doing, leading me to ask this question. Did you hear what I just said? Well, family, can I tell you, it is that same question that the Lord is asking us. Did you hear what I just said? And that very question, it indicates this, that God is speaking, but also that we're not listening. And oftentimes, family, we can find ourselves asking the question, well, does God speak? Is he speaking to me? How come I can't hear him? It seems like the voice of God is shut out in my life. No, it's not a matter of if he's speaking, if God speaks, or how come I can't hear him, but rather I am not positioned to hear him, which causes me to ask these questions. And can I tell you the reason why we ask these questions, family, is because we are living distracted. We are living a distracted life, and when we are distracted, we can't hear the voice of God. The frequency becomes jammed. And so this morning, I want us to identify some spaces and places in life that often distract us from the voice of God and how with a plan that we can position ourselves to overcome those distractions, to hear God's voice. So just for a few moments, you may have discovered it already. I want to speak from this title, 
did you hear what I just said? Come on, can you tell your neighbor next to you, did you just hear what I just said? Okay, they didn't apparently. So try the other neighbor and say, okay, they didn't hear me, but did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? Gotta wake up. <laughs> hey, so to give some context to the text, Jesus and the disciples, they just uh, entered this village called Bethany. And Bethany is a village, it's a place where some of Jesus' friends reside. And now some of us, we need to hear that. Jesus had friends. Because, because some of us, we so high and holy, we think we can't cool, we can't be cool and kick it no more. But Jesus himself had friends. So we know you holy, but you can chill sometimes, okay? You ain't always got to bring the scripture. We trying to watch the game. You know what I mean? Right? So Jesus, he, he had friends. And he just like, yo, hey, let's go pull up on Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Yes, the Lazarus that he, Jesus raised from the dead. So he pulls up. And Martha answers the door like, oh, what's up, Jesus? Good to see you. Oh, you brought some friends with you. It was, it was uh, his crew, D12, you know, the disciples. And so uh, they, they pulled up as well. So they come on into the house. And, and, and Martha, she's like, man, so good to see you. It's been a minute. Y'all come on in. Take care of y'all. So she heads to the kitchen. And she's like, look, I was, I was just making something. I got extra. So, look, I got y'all too. And so she starts preparing uh, lemon pepper wings, all flats. And it was good. It was good to go. But then there was this moment where Martha's like, hold on. Where Mary? And so she peeked around the corner. Mary in there sitting down listening to the story. So Martha's like, hold on, Jesus, uh-uh, this something is not right. You need to tell her, some of y'all got it, you need to tell her to get up and get here in this kitchen and help me with these lemon pepper wings all flats that you requested when you showed up with D12. Something is wrong with this. But Mary, she was enjoying sitting down listening to the story because Jesus was catching up. It had been a minute. So Jesus was like, listen, listen, you got you to hear this. You got to hear this. So there was one guy, and he was blind, and he couldn't see. And I said, bro, look, look, look. Here, here go the mud. I spit on him and put it on his face. And then he talking about, I was like, what you see? He said, P he said trees. I said, there ain't no trees. Them people. Try again. And then he finally saw. So Mary's enjoying the story. She's like, this is good. But Martha's like, hold on. You over here talking about all flats, I need some help. But then Jesus says to her, to Martha, like, yo, relax. You're getting distracted by all these things. You're getting worked up. You're into all of these details. Just, just calm down. Hold on. Settle down. You are distracted. But what Mary has discovered, Martha, it's the good thing. It's the right thing. It's what's not going to be taken away from her. She has discovered what to do in this moment. Family, here's my question for us. What is it that, that's distracting us? What is it that is causing us to miss the moment that is right in front of us? Because family, if we can't identify and eliminate the distractions that cloud the voice of God in our lives, then we could run the risk of living out of rhythm because our lives are out of step with God. So we want our lives to be in step with the Lord. But the only way to do that is to hear his voice. And so for the next few moments, what we're going to do is identify some distractions that most of us in this room that we share in and how we can limit their effectiveness when it comes from hearing the voice of God. And if you're taking notes, you can do so in your journal or either the TBC app, you can follow along. But here it is. The first distraction is this, the distraction of busyness. The distraction of busyness. It's almost become normal in today's culture as a response to this question, how are you doing? Busy. You know how I know? Because I bet today, showed up, fresh off a of fall break, feeling good, saw somebody hadn't seen in a while. Yeah, what's going on? I ain't seen you in a minute. How you been? Busy. What you doing next week? Busy. That don't even make sense. <laughs> right? It's like busy has become the, the, the natural, automatic response. And I get it. 
Because culture kind of pushes this idea that if you're not busy, you're not advancing. You know, in the world, we try to figure out what team we on, right? Like, like Team uh, Drake or, or Team Kendrick or, you know, we said we're part of Team, no, uh, excuse me, Team Church. But have you discovered this, that there's another team called Team No Sleep? And everybody seems like they want to be on it. I'm on team, no sleep. I'm hustling all day. I'm grinding all night. I'm trying to secure the bag. I'm trying to get it. I'm going to retire at 40 and do none. So I got to get crypto and I got to get this and I got to be in all these other things. I'm on team, no sleep. And family, when you do that, we're living life absent of rhythm. And then I'll hear these these discussions about, man, I'm just really trying to bring balance to my life. And I'm like, really? Are you? Because you have 55 things going on. I don't know if you're really trying to bring balance. But then I'm like this. I think the perspective may be off. It's not balance that we need to try to achieve, but it's actually rhythm. Because if you look at the creation narrative, it, when Jesus, when God created the heavens and the earth, when he created the soul, there, there, there's no idea of balance. But what you see is rhythm because it says the first six days, for six days he worked, but then on the seventh day he rested. That's six over here and one over here. That's not balanced, but what that is is a rhythm. We've talked about this before. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's rhythm, but it's not balanced. So he rested. He was still. So I get it that your favorite Instagram life coach is going to give you the keys to have a, live a successful life about how, listen, I go to bed at 8 p.m. and I wake up at 8.09 p.m. because I'm on my grind. All I need is nine minutes because I'm moving. <laughs> no, you need sleep. <laughs> you tired, dog? And coffee ain't going to do it because all that is is a mask over, over actual energy. And you try to get out of this fog and just fill it up with caffeine and it doesn't work. So listen, yeah, you're moving, but don't confuse movement with momentum. Because you could jump on a treadmill and you could put it on nine and move everywhere but go nowhere. Right? So don't confuse movement with momentum. You could be a hamster on a wheel. A lot of action, a lot of motion, but not going anywhere. Family, the momentum that you're looking for in life will not come from constant movement, but rather the ability to sit down and be with God. Now, that is so counterintuitive to the way we're wired through culture. We are wired that we always have to do. We always have to go. We always need to be on to the next thing. But can I tell you, sometimes the next thing is to sit down. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Knowing God comes in being still, not in always moving. You look at Jesus, oftentimes he went away, and one of the practices of the faith was silence and solitude. Sitting down and being quiet. When was the last time, family, you went somewhere, you sat down in that corner in your house, outside on the porch, where the kids are up, get up earlier, it's just the way it's going to have to be right now. Get up early, go outside, sit down, no device, no Apple Watch, nothing, and you listened and you heard the birds sing, and through the singing of the birds, you heard your creator talk to you. You got to discover him, to know that he is mighty, to know that he is worthy, to know that he is forgiven, to know that he's full of grace, to know that he's full of truth. When have you sat down to discover who he is? It's where we can get the right perspective is where we can get life in, in the right order to prioritize the right thing. It's where Matthew 6, comes into play where it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is not first as in on a grocery list, but this is first as in center. So make him the center of your life and begin to watch every aspect of your life come into proper Priority and to right order. It's important, family, because when our life is out of order, life will become more about doing rather than being. Because now I'm trying to play catch up. 
Because I have lived life out of order, I've always got to do to get in right order. And what you realize, it's a moving target that you can never catch up to. So what if we sit down and allow ourselves to discover the right priority and live from the right perspective? It comes from being still. Now, as I say all of this, don't take it as a license like, mm, I need to call my boss tomorrow and say, hey, bruh. Listen, I got to sit down. I wish I could be there. I know that contract has got to get signed, but I got to sit down. I know, I know we got people in the field, but I got to sit down. I, I can't do it right now. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. Because some of us, we like, yo, I'm trying to work, so I ain't got to work no more. Okay, slash feedback. Can I tell you, a, the goal is not to live and work to the point that I don't have to work anymore. The goal is maybe so you don't have to work the way you have to work, but there's there's nowhere in here that talks about this idea of retire. We serve a God who neither slumbers nor sleeps. So this whole thing about I need to retire at 40, I need to retire at 45, listen, no, you may need to redirect your energy and your efforts in a different way, but not this idea of retiring. Because I think when we get that perspective is, one, maybe because we have lived in a way that maybe has been out of alignment or we haven't, like, discovered purpose that is fulfilling. And so what we're talking about is I don't want to do what is not fulfilling anymore, and that's fine. But discover what that is as you have worked to be able to position yourself to do that. But the idea to, like, hey, I'm going to go in the house and sit down and do nothing, that's not what God is calling us to. And here's why. Not many amens, I understand. But here's why. Because work is holy. Work is of God. Remember, he worked for six days, and then he rested. I started over again, right? Work is of God. And and listen, because sometimes we say, well, work is because of what happened in the garden when sin entered the world. That's it. Mm -mm. No, work happened before the fall. Genesis 2.15. Look at it. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it. And take care of it. Work is holy. Work is of God. It's in work that you can even see God. So so don't think that I'm saying, okay, well, I need to stop working. No, 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 no. Because, in fact, look at verse 40 of our text. It talks about Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now, oftentimes when this text is used, here's what happens. We put Mary in one corner, and we put Martha in the next. And it's, like, and it's, it's, it's said, choose. Are you going to be a Martha? Or are you going to be a Mary? And it paints this picture that what Martha was doing was bad. Inherently, what Martha was doing was not bad at all. So, so you know, we talk about being a follower of Jesus, being a disciple, being one who practiced the way of Jesus. We want to be with him, become like him, and do what he did. And we look at his life as a model of how to do that. And what Jesus modeled out for us are what we call the practices of the way. The way was what it was called prior to Christianity. If you look through the book of Acts, you will see those of the way, right? And, and part of that, one of those practices is hospitality, which is what Martha is practicing right here. Some folks pulled up on her, some people she know, and she decided to practice hospitality. Jesus did that all through our scripture. How many times do we see him reclining at a table, sharing a meal? So this is what Martha is doing. So that's not bad at all. She's serving. She is practicing the way of Jesus. And can I tell you that, that that's many of us in the room today. You're busy because of the business. So you're asking a question. You're trying to figure out. You have this tension. Well, how can providing for my family be bad? I don't understand that. Or maybe it's sports and you find yourself at a field from weekend to weekend, from city to city, and you're saying, well, how can investing in my kids be bad? Can I tell you, family, it's not at all. Neither of those things are bad. What Martha was doing, it's not bad. But here's what we got to discover, that in a moment 
where Martha found herself doing, she actually needed to just simply be. She actually needed to take a page out of Mary's book and just be. And I wonder for us, there's always one more deal for the business to be closed. There's always one more contract to be awarded. There's always one more, hold on, I'm going to be there, let me respond to this email type moment. There's always one more tournament. There's always one more season. And I just wonder, could a moment where we find ourselves doing the Lord said, I just wanted you to be so you could gain the perspective of what to do next. So then life feels like a grind. It feels heavy. It feels weighty because we didn't give ourselves the moment to simply be. It's about understanding that I can be both a worker and a worshiper. So hear me. We don't need to try to find this badge of honor, of busyness, but rather allowing ourselves to just chill for a minute and be still. So if you're in here today and you're like, yo, this has become my life. I'm always busy. What's the remedy? It's very simple. You may leave. You may leave. It's very simple. Here's the remedy. Slow down. I told you. It's very simple. Simply slow down. Don't be in a hurry. You know, we were on fall break this week. We had, we had, we had went to the beach, and, and, and we got up, and, and the kids were doing their thing, and I went and got some, some breakfast and brought it back uh, to the house, and, and Katie and I, we went out on the, um, the little patio thing. And I was like, you know what? This is nice because normally we, we go eat somewhere and then got to rush to get to the beach, but we brought it back, and we slowing down. I said, girl, this feels good. What I read at um, Chameleon, it came from drinking that coffee and sitting down. The Lord was speaking. I was like, okay, I got you, Lord. So I wonder how many of those moments we miss because we don't slow down. But you say, I can't slow down because I got so many things to do. Well, listen, learn to say yes to the right thing, not everything. Because everything we do, we don't need. Because hurry is a great enemy to a great spiritual life. So when you feel disconnected from God, could it be because you're in a hurry? Of all the things that Jesus had to do in Scripture, we see that he never ran anywhere. And he knew he had three years to fulfill his mission, but he never ran anywhere. He walked. Even, even these folks right here, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, Martha, and, and Mary, they sent word to Jesus like, yo, the one you love is sick. Come quick. He got that text message. Come oh, quick, what you doing? Hey, so listen, here's what we're going to do. He went right about his business. And then the scripture tells us he let four days go by. The one you love is sick. Your family, your boy, he's sick. Come quick. Jesus did and he took his time. So here's what I'm getting at, family. Living life hurried is not of God. Living life out of pace is not of God. That Jesus Christ himself, he did not hurry to get anywhere, yet he fulfilled what he was called to fulfill on this earth. So why do you and I think we need to live in a constant state of hurry? When we do that, we lose the frequency of God's voice. So now what seems like God isn't God, it was a distraction. And now we say yes to the wrong thing when he says, if you would just sit still, you would have heard and you would have known that that company was about to fail before you took that job. So slow down and be still. But maybe for some of us, maybe it's not busyness. Here's another one. It's this, the distraction of self. The distraction of self. Now, don't raise your hand on this, but you know that person that they're never wrong. Don't, don't raise your hand. Elbow counts too. Okay, somebody ain't listening because they just looked at their spouse. You trying to get in trouble. You trying to get in trouble. <laughs> but that person who's always right, they never get it wrong. And it's their fault why this didn't work out. It's their fault why that didn't work out. And then you just listen to them. You're like, man, I'm not great at math. Two plus two, four. That sounds like you. You're at the center of all these stories. Could it be that it's you? Okay. How many of us were that person? Again, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Sometimes, family, the biggest distraction of hearing God's voice 
It's us. I look in the mirror. Because sometimes we get in our own way. And this is true primarily because we come to God with our statements instead of with questions. Here's what I mean. God, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the job I'm taking. Here's the decision I'm making. Here's who I'm going to date. Here's all these different things that that we tell him. Here's what we are doing. Instead of coming to him with questions, Lord, what do you think about this job? Lord, what do you think about this opportunity? Because don't you know, Scripture talks about how his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so when we come to him with questions, Lord, what do you think about this job? He can tell us, no, it looks good on the surface, but he's saying no because he's like, you don't understand, that boss is wild. And if you think you're not with your family now, we'll wait till you get over there. But then when you just make that decision without consulting him and asking him, then you get over there and then we wonder why we're stressed out, why we're tired, why we're weary. It's because in a moment that required a question, we decided to come to God with a statement. So listen, don't move only wishing to have waited to move on God. So don't move on your own ideas. Move on God. Because hear me, the only difference between a blessing and a burden is timing. Did y'all catch that? So look, I got to ask y'all, did y'all hear what I just said? The only difference between a blessing and a burden is timing. What do you mean? Blessing is the right thing at the right time. While burden is the right thing at the wrong time. So yeah, that job looks great. Wrong time. Yeah, that opportunity looks awesome. Wrong time. And what happens, family, we'll say, that looks like the open door. That looks like the opportunity. But if it's out of the right time, family, it moves from being a blessing to a burden. And so what should be bringing life to you, what should be exciting, what should bring provision, what should be the thing that answered the prayer that your pray is becoming a burden. And we find ourselves saying, Lord, this is what I asked for. But why is it coming with this? Why did it look like this? He said, it's because you were out of time with me. You are out of step with me and you need to know that your steps are ordered by me but you need to walk in the steps that I have ordered. Stop asking me to walk in the steps that you want to order. It's about timing. So don't move on your word. Move on God's word. And I will say slide your feedback. Believe him right there. Many of us can't move on God's word. Because we aren't in his word. So we don't know how to move. Because we don't know what his word says. And hear me, family, it's important to know what his word says because the surest way to hear God's voice is through his word. It's through his word. Because listen, the word of God is what he has spoken, but it's also what he is speaking. Hebrews 4.12, it reminds us, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. For the Lord of God is alive and active. That's why when people take this stance that the Lord doesn't speak, I guess Hebrews 4.12 is not included within their text. Because it says, for the word of God, this right here is alive and and active, that the Bible is the only book that while you read it, can I tell you, it's reading you. You can read other books and you'll just read it, but you read this book and it reads you. And it doesn't read you to shame you. It doesn't read you to guilt you, but it reads you to bring freedom, to bring transformation, to bring hope, to see how this is his story, but it's it's history, but it's his story of his goodness and how he has decided to include us in it. So listen, if you're sick, read his word that tells you how you can be healed. If you feel like you're in bondage, read his word that tells you how you can be free. It's a lie and active. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, leave your feet there, because you may say, well, that's, that's cool, but, but how do I do this? So, okay, really quickly, because we got to go really quickly, there's this method called SOAP. You may have heard it before. If not, no worries. We're about to talk about it. It's S-O-A-P, and it stands for this. 
Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. And I, I won't go through all of this, but we'll, we'll make it available. Uh, but I want you to just look at it. So, so say you're having your devotion time. Let's practically walk through this. So it's, it's morning, and maybe you got small kids, so you had to get up at 4. If your kids are like mine, I'm like, y'all need to sleep. But you get up early, and you got your Bible, throw some, throw some worship music on for like a few, few moments, you know, become and worship mighty God. We sang it today. That's a good one to, to use. And, and so iTunes, download it now, Spotify, YouTube. Um, and, and, and you just let it play for a little bit. It kind of settle yourself down and wake up a little bit. And now you get your journal out. You got your, you got your word. And say you turn to Psalm 23, 23rd Psalm, and you just get to verse 1. And you, you read the complete chapter, but verse 1 really stuck out to you. So now you take verse 1, and, and you just you, you write it down. So you write scripture. Uh, go to the next one for me. You, oh, scripture. There, thank you. You write, you know, earlier I said, let's give it up for the worship team. But you know you can't hear the worship team without the production team. You can't see them without the production team. Can we pause for the cause and give it up for the production team? They're preaching, too, because you can't see it. With, so let's give it up for the production team. So you, got, you write scripture at the top of the page. And then verse 1 really stuck out to you. The Lord really highlighted it to you. You asked the Lord, Lord, speak to me in this moment, and he will. And so this one stuck out to you. So you wrote down, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. So then, okay, you're going to make some observations about it. What, what could the Lord be speaking to me through this? So now you, you wrote down some observations. And this is just some, this is some observations I, I just wrote. Uh, man, Katie drove back most of the trip from the beach. I was like, man, this is amazing. So I had time to work on the sermon. That, that don't happen too often. You could tell I said it because it was cool. But I was, yes. And, and so I just started writing down some ob observations. And you can read it here. I won't, I won't read it all. And I just begin writing down, like, man, what is the Lord saying to me in this verse? Same thing that you can do with whatever verse, whatever scripture, whatever text that it is. And so the next, so, so we wrote down the scripture. We wrote observation. And then next we write, we write application. And so now, because it's not just good enough to, to be uh, hearers of the word, but we need to know how to be doers as well. So how do I apply this to my life? So here's what I wrote down. I was just thinking, okay, how do I apply that the Lord is my shepherd? And I love that, that word, my. Like, it's personal. Like, he knows you and all the people of the world, but he knows you. He knows what you, he's my shepherd. But, but so how do I apply this to my life? I can remind my, I can be reminded that I'm not living this life alone, but I'm covered by my shepherd. So no matter what season of life, he's got me. So that's how I can apply that. That's how we can apply that. So when you step into a doctor's office and you hear something that you didn't anticipate here, you say, yo, I'm covered by the shepherd. He's got me. When they're tripping on the job and you don't know what you're going to do next, you're like, you know what? I'm covered by the shepherd. He's got me. You can apply this to your life. But, but then not just there because, you know, you want to get your prayers answered? Pray the word because the word will not fail. It will not return to God. It will not return to him void, but it will accomplish what it was sent out to do. So you pray the word. And so then you just pray it. Father, I thank you for me and my shepherd. Thank you for your hand of protection, your grace, your love, your mercy. Help me to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a real practical way, family, that we can sit down and begin to rightly divide the word. And can I tell you, as you consistently do this, this will spill out in your life. And so if you've ever been around that person who seems like they just pray scripture, it's probably because they did something like this. They didn't, they, that's, that's the code, that's the cheat code that they discovered. They just didn't tell you about it. Well, I, I gave up the secret today, right? And as you do this, you will see your life becoming bigger and better and full because now the word is just oozing out of you because you're just in it. And it's not just oozing out of you. You're living it. And so you know how you try to go to the, to the ATM and try to get some money out that you didn't put in? No. But now because you've deposited a word in your heart, you can go in there. You can pull it out when you get a report that you did. No, 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 no. I don't believe that report, but I believe the report of the Lord that says I'm healed. But you got to deposit it in there first. Are so y'all tracking with me? This morning, and I'm excited because in 2025 we're gonna do a, a, a entire collection just simply on the on the Bible, and we're gonna break it down and we're gonna talk about it. So I'm looking for that forward to that in 2025. So sometimes it's the distraction of self, and here's the last one because I gotta get y'all out of here. Here's the last one: the distraction of worry. Can I tell you, family? Worry is available around the corner. Worry is like the boogeyman. It's around the corner looking to get you. 
It's the boogeyman underneath the bed. You got to hurry up and turn the lights on in the room because the boogeyman is there called worry. I mean, do not open up Instagram. Worry. It's over. Do not check your favorite news outlet. Worry. It's over. Can I tell you, don't have a headache and go to Google. Listen, you got 10 minutes. That's it. On the right side, if your arm, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just puts you in this place of worry. But that's the world. And that's why we can relate to Martha in verse 41, where Jesus says, you are worried and upset over many things. But look what the Bible says. Apostle Paul, I call him my cousin Paul. Look what he says, Philippians 4, 6. He says, don't worry about anything. So don't worry about how your marriage is on the rocks. Don't worry about your health. Don't worry about your kids. Don't worry about your job. Don't worry about all these other things. Okay, so I don't worry about it. So what what then did I do? Well, look what he says. He says, instead, pray about your health. Pray about your job. Pray about your marriage. Pray about your kids. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. You say, wait wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm worrying because I need a different outcome. So why am I spending time thanking God for what he's done? You know why? Because when we thank God for what he's done, it can remind us of what he can do. Because the fact that he done something, it means that you had a need before. And God fulfilled it. And he answered it. So, Lord, while I stand right here in the need of prayer, in the need of a miracle, I can still thank you for what you have done, trusting you for what you are about to do. So, yeah, I will thank you and give you praise while believing for what you're going to do do next. Come on, can we actually pause for the calls right there and give, oh, come on, I know we got to go, but we can't get it twisted. Can we just give God some praise for what he has done while believing for what we still need him to do? Because he's faithful and he's big enough and he's more than able to do it. So listen, we can't live in a state of worry because when we live in a state of worry, we settle into fear of what if while dismissing the reality of what has not. So all of life becomes about, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And what if this takes place? And what if that takes place? I saw a study that says 82% of the things that we worry about, they never happen. So how many moments with the Lord have we missed because we've been in this place of worry? Family, worry becomes the static that clouds the frequency between our ears and God's voice. Worry is a barrier to hearing the voice of God. Listen, when we worry, we will live life with an anticipation of what's going to happen to us instead of an expectation of what God can do through us. Family, don't allow worry to kill your expectation. We become fear-filled believers instead of faith-filled ones. But listen, we have not been called to live this way. 1 Peter 5, 7. Look what he tells us. He says, cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So I said, Lord, I need to make sure that your people know in the Greek what the word all means. So I looked it up. You want to know what the word all means? All. So y'all cheated. Y'all was all y'all came prepared. It means all, everything that you can worry about, everything that you can have anxiety about. Cast it on him. What does the word cast mean? It means to throw. It means to to put on to him, right? It says, literally, I'm going to throw this, and it's going to stick on you, and it's going to come off me because we were not wired. We weren't built to hold it. So the Lord says, listen, I'm strong. I'm mighty in battle. I'm this king of glory. Put it on me because I can handle it. But how many of us, we are choosing to hold on to things instead of putting them on to God? And listen, family, when you carry what you were not meant to carry, it'll affect your walk. Your walk is off. You don't walk straight. You can't hear. You can't see. You can't think. Everything is clouded. I was like, Lord, I don't know if they're going to get that. So I might might need a visual to kind of help us. So real quick, I got a visual to help us real quick. Got a visual. So check this out. So, So all these things in life that come at us. That, that scripture tells us to cast these things on the Lord. But you know what? You know what we decided to do? We like, you know what? Nope. I need a little regret. I need a little regret in my life, right? We're like, I need a little regret. So we just kind of start walking around with regret. And why did I make that decision? How did I let myself get there? I told the Lord, like, yo, you get me out of this one. I ain't going to get there again. I knew better, 
but I didn't do better. And so now we're just walking around with regret instead of giving it to the Lord. And now we run the risk of it becoming part of our identity. But then we don't stop there. Whatever reason, family, we decided to pick up depression. Because now, because of all of what I'm regretting, I'm, I'm down. It's, it's hard to get out the bed. Some days I can actually get out the bed and I can fake the smile long enough. I know the program responses. How you doing? I'm blessing the holy favor of the Lord. But inside, it's turmoil. Can't think straight. Can't. And well, as before, my walk was a little bit easier. But now, tripping over things. Can't get things right. Always seem to be something in my way. My walk is affected. But then it's, it's, not, just, it's not just that. Now, now I pick up, there's, there's anxiety. And now... It's getting, ooh, this is tough. It's getting difficult to walk. I'm, I'm always concerned about what's next, what's around the corner, and, and then, uh-oh, but I, I thought I'd let it go. I went to the altar, but no, it's still with me. And, and, and now all this, this is tough. This is, this is difficult. This is like bad per, bag person. Like, you're going to hurt your back, and, and I'm carrying all this with me, and I just... I can't, but that's, that's not enough. The anxiety, the, the depression, the, the, the regret. But it also Alabama loss. And now I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm dealing. That wasn't supposed to be cheers. This person is struggling. But now I'm, my walk is affected. And now I'm wondering how come I can't hear the voice of God. I see he's calling me there, but I'm trying to get there. But for whatever reason, I'm, I'm in this direction. It's because I'm walking with all these things that I, were not, I was not designed to walk with family. Instead, if we can just cast off what happened last night and let go of the anxiety and let go of the regret and let go of the depression that we can walk in true freedom to know and understand that when the Lord says to cast it to me, that he means to throw it. He means to get ugly about it. He means to forget it and give it to me because I care for you. You were not designed to walk in regret, to walk in fear, to carry anxiety and depression and all these things, but to cast them on me because I care for you. Family, many of us, we can't hear God because our baggage has become our bondage. And so now we are bound to these things. But John 8, 36 says, no, who the Son says free is free indeed. Look at yourself in the mirror. No, you're a free person. You're a free man. You're a free woman. You're not, a, you're not bound to what happened last year. You're not bound to be defined by that divorce. You're not bound to be defined by that breakup, by that sickness, by that hurt, by that pain, by that disappointment. That is not who you are, but you are Free. And when you realize that freedom that you live in, you can hear the voice of God. Is that a song I can see clearly now? That the, I can hear clearly now the rain is gone. Come on. Anybody want to hear clear? Anybody want to hear the voice of the Lord? Then let go of the rain that's in your life. Let go of what's clouding the frequency. Oh, come on now. I'm talking about you fulfilling destiny here. I'm talking about you being united to purpose here. You got to cast it on them. Woo! Who the sun says free is free indeed. Exchange your worry for God's freedom. But you know what? You know what? You know what? I promise you we got to go. We got to go. We really do. You know, oftentimes we're like, Lord, your voice is going to be in the dynamic. It's going to be in the spectacular. But listen, it's not always the case. There's this story in 1 Kings 19, and it backs up a little bit before that. 
where the prophet Elijah, he has this great battle and he destroys the prophets of Baal, a false god, and Jezebel's upset about it. She's like, yo, I'm going to hunt you down and what you did to those prophets are the same thing I'm going to do for you, do to you. And so now uh, Elijah, he's, he's depressed and he's walking around with it and he's letting the Lord know about it. He go hides in the cave and the Lord's like, yo, no, that's not it. You're going to hear my voice. And so there's the, the, the wind comes by, the fire comes by, the earthquake comes by, and all these things that are spectacular that you would think that the voice of the Lord would have been in there, 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13. But we see that the voice of the Lord was not in the wind, it wasn't in the fire, it wasn't in the earthquake, but it was in the still voice, the still quiet voice, the still small voice. You know what that tells us? Sometimes to hear the voice of the Lord, you got to be still, that you got to be quiet. You know how they used to tell you, go sit down somewhere. The Lord is looking at us and saying, go sit down somewhere so you can hear my voice and receive the guidance, the direction, the discernment on what to do next. But family, I'm not just speaking to you about something that, that's just a theory, an idea to me. I'm speaking to you about something that is a reality to me. It's been over 10 years now, but I remember for six years, I, w- I, w- I was a contract analyst. And, and, and here I am every single day out there on the arsenal and, 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 and walking up those, those stairs. I, I came in early at six and, and, and not because I wanted to work so hard. I just wanted to get off so I can go to the gym. But but I'm getting in in there early and I'm walking up those stairs and I'm like, Lord, I should feel differently about this. I should be excited about this. What a great opportunity this is. I'm I'm out here, my wife's out here and man, this is secure, this is good. We can can ride this wave and we'll we'll, we'll set ourselves up. But all while I just felt like ah, God was saying, hey, there's something different, there's something different. I'm like, yeah, but okay, but this is what I feel right now. I just would begin to listen in my own quiet time, in my own time with him. Can I tell you, it was this small voice. Like, I wanted to go to a conference, y'all, and I wanted the, I wanted the man of God, the woman of God, be like, yo, listen, you right there, black shirt over there, uh-uh, to the left. But it wasn't that. It was this quiet, still voice that reminded me when I think I was about seven or eight years old at a in a hot, sweaty church in El Paso, Texas, at the front. Not because I wanted to, but we was new. So everybody here knew. You just because I said, turn your, to your neighbor and say, did you hear what I just said? They used to make you come down to the front. And I was down at the front. And the pastor said, you're going to pastor one day. I didn't know what that meant, so I was like, whatever. And I remember again, at 16, same thing. And at 16, I'm like, you tripping. I'm out here hooping. Like, I got hoop dreams. What you talking about, pastor? But the Lord began to remind me of those moments. But it gave me direction of what to pray into and what to ask him, Lord, are you really calling me to full-time ministry? I didn't have a perspective of what that even looked like. And so all I knew to do was to say yes. Now I was afraid. I was like, Lord, we just got married. We found out we got a mortgage, and, and we found out two months in, we got a kid on the way. How, how Katie going to respond to this? And this is why it's so important of who you marry. Because this girl, she said, hey, if that's what the Lord is saying to do, then you know we only got one response. It's to do it. I said, but what about the money, girl? God will provide. Y'all thought, I know I'm the one full of faith. It's her. And so with no direction, other than just the go of God, we, we, we stepped out. And now over 10 years ago, can I tell you, when I said yes to him, I didn't see this. But this came from just a small, mundane moment sitting in a cubicle. So don't tell me that the Lord can't speak to you in a quiet moment that will change the trajectory of your life. It is my becoming story. But what's yours? What could your becoming story be? That's what the message of becoming is. It's understanding that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. 
So if you don't like where your life is right now, you don't have to give up. Just keep on going. Just keep on growing. Just keep on progressing. Just keep on becoming. But here's the key ingredient. You need to hear his voice. So don't dismiss the mundane because the mundane could be a precursor for a miracle. What could it be speaking to you in the silence? What could he be speaking to you in the still moments, in the ordinary moments? It could be the very thing that changes your life. Come on, let's pray. Father. Hey, this is Michael Hamilton, and thank you for engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make a decision to follow Jesus. And if that's the case, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Say, today, Jesus, I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we're celebrating with you and the decision that you made to follow Jesus. And we want to walk this decision out with you. Would you do us a favor and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now below? Listen, we're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Would you do us a favor? And if this has encouraged you and blessed you in any kind of way, would you send it to a friend? Perhaps it'll do the same for them. And also be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube channel. That way you can continue to engage with more content like this.